Good morning, everyone. Very happy to have you all here today. We got a full house. So if you have a spot next to you, please leave it open. We'll have some people coming in yet. As you're aware, there's severe weather coming into the area. So just wanted to let you know we are under a thunderstorm warning and a tornado watch. If that changes, we'll make sure to come and let you know and we'll head down into the basement of the building, okay? But just so you're aware of the protocol of what's gonna happen, we'll come in and let you know. We'll unfortunately have to interrupt Fred, uh, but he's got all day so he can keep going as long as he needs to. We'll get him a mic and he can present downstairs in the hallway. Sound good. Thank you and enjoy the class. I'm gonna hand things off to Kit and we can get started, okay? Thank you. You didn't expect a class to start like that today, did you? <laughs> this could be exciting. <laughs> so we'll have to make it a short time down in the basement, real short time. Well, good morning again, and we're looking forward to a wonderful presentation today. Something unusual for us, I think. My name is Kit Leggett, and I am a member of the Social Sciences subcommittee here at HASP. And uh, Fred and I have been talking about the presentation, what uh, might be a possibility here for us to talk about an event that happened some time ago. So I need to have you raise your hands and let me know if you would remember a time in our history called McCarthyism. Were you around? Oh, we have a lot of, <laughs> a lot of people are going to be asking questions today. Yeah, because <laughs> oh, they forget. Well, with that in mind, uh, it's going to be ex extremely interesting. <laughs> We're going to be, here comes, I'm watching Ian to see if he's going to come. Oh, okay, good deal. Well, we have three sessions today, today's session is called the <laughs> that's great that's great <laughs> uh, yeah right <laughs> today's session is called the vulture of opportunism and um <clears throat> fred has uh, <clears throat> um made, as I said, two more sessions for us to attend the next Wednesday and the following Wednesday. And you know about the topic, so let's just say a little bit about Fred, although you know him quite well. I see a lot of usual suspects out here. So I think that it would behoove me to say that Fred has been teaching. He is a professor of history, and he's been there for 20, over 22 years. And <clears throat> he uh, also teaches a class in the American Civil War at the Muskegon Correctional Facility. Uh, some of you know about that. Some of you heard his class earlier this year. It's a, a challenging class for him to teach, but we know he does it very well. He is um, also very interested in military history and African history. And uh, there are so many things about him that we have come to know and appreciate and without further ado, I would like to hand it over to our friend, Dr. Fred Johnson. Thanks, Kit. Thank you, Kit. And seriously, I'm just, I'm so happy that you all, it's always a, it's always a treat to speak to a gathering of people who know a little bit beforehand about what I'm talking about. I said something the other day to my students that said, you remember when we went into Iraq in 2003 and they were like, no. <laughs> And I said, wow, they're only 20 years old. That's right. They, they wouldn't have been born at that time. So they, they really don't know. So for them, it really is history. But yes, we're, we're looking into, as Kip pointed out, the vulture of opportunism, because what could be more appropriate to talk about this individual, this subject, than a creature that feasts on carrion, the carrion of lies and division and fear and greed. In other words, appealing to all the worst of our instincts. So let's get started. I told myself putting this together, I said, you know, you, you really should be neutral 
on the subject. That's what historians are. Historians are not supposed to be biased and all that kind of stuff. But I said, I think this, I think most American, many Americans would generally agree this guy is pretty much, pretty much a repugnant individual on the basis of why he did what he did when he did it, he exploited people's lives and the, and the lives he destroyed. Now look, conspiracy theories in America are nothing new. We, it's, it's, not, it's not just confined to this country, obviously. And it's not just confined to our time. But there is something uniquely unusual about the way conspiracy theories start, spread, and thrive in the United States. It is, I think, one of the things that the founders did not, except for maybe possibly George Washington and his farewell address when he warned about the rise of factionalism, that people could be separated, and that people would use unscrupulous methods to include taking the Constitution, to use the tools of the Constitution to hollow out the Constitution. In other words, the very tools of the Republic, they built the Republic to destroy the Republic. This is what George Washington was warning against in 1796 when he left office. And if anybody knew about the perils of fighting against totalitarianism or absolutism and what it could do to a nation, it was George Washington. The founding fathers were raised in a classical educational environment where they did study Greek scholars, Roman scholars, they studied forms of government. Today, we would call it civics. If you all remember McCarthyism, you probably remember also, too, in 1958, when Dwight, when Dwight Eisenhower passed something called the National Defense Education Act in response to Sputnik, which was launched on October 4th, 1957. At that time, the, the general belief was that the Russians were behind us technologically, culturally for sure, but then all of a sudden they got a satellite going around the world that's been put up there by a rocket. Now, today is a pretty much a humorous thing to say, it's just rocket science. Back in 1957, rocket science was a pretty mysterious territory. To launch a rocket, was a big deal. Most of us went like this. <laughs> so the Russians did that, and it didn't take too much creative imagination to figure out that if the Russians could put a satellite on a rocket, at that time you could also put nuclear weapons on a rocket and have them fall from space, which of course we have weapons that can do that literally today. They're called MERS, multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles. So when President Eisenhower passed the NDEA, that was a response to how did the Russians get in front of us? How far are we behind? And that wonderful American question, whose fault is it? And that NDA, it changed American higher education completely. All of a sudden, this, we say we need more mathematicians, more scientists, more engineers. We've got to catch up to the Russians, close the missile gap, all these things. It was the beginning of what you all know of the STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And so education has swung completely that direction to the increasing demise of humanities, to include my field, his, history, political science, English, music, art, you know, all the things that make us human beings. Now, with that kind of, that, that kind of uh, hollowing out of the environment where the people that engage in thoughts of the, uh, in, in studies of the mind and so forth, and what makes conspiracy, conspiracy theories get planted and spread, it's right for that kind of thing to take place all the time even more so when people are talking less about how to stop it. For example, there were conspiracy theories about Pearl Harbor. Some of you have probably heard the fact that FDR either knew Pearl Harbor was coming and did nothing about it, or hand in hand, or had a hand in making it happen. Well, that requires some, some interrogation at several levels. One did an American president, a chief executive, a commander of the Army and Navy, would actually be involved in an attack that kills 2,400 American citizens and launches a nation into a global conflict. The premise ought to be ridiculous enough, but there are people who believed it and believe it. There were in our conspiracy theories about did we really walk on the moon? There was just some staging area out in, out in Arizona. There were conspiracy theories about 9-11, that it was an inside job. The steel that they used in the, in the World Trade Center, the steel was too high or too, too of a, such a high quality that it took a special kind of gasoline from the airplanes that would burn that steel down and make, this, and make the towers collapse. All kinds of things that happened, and people believe this stuff. There's been a persisting theory about once upon a time, I used to have hair. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yes. <laughs> that clearly was not true. <laughs> or no longer true. <laughs> For conspiracy the theory to take root and to spread, particularly in our American way, you have to have the additional ingredients of bullies, fear, greed, and cowardice. I hate cowards. I really do. When I was in grad school, when I was in, 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 in my undergrad in Maryland, a guy came into the, the auto parts store one night. I was the assistant manager there, and he threatened to cut me, to stab me, because I wouldn't give him a full refund on something that he bought. Well, couldn't do it. And the way like this guy wouldn't do it, because he had just gotten out of the joint, for stabbing someone. So he had been in jail, so he would do it. But I told him, he kept causing a disturbance, and I said, look, you know who I am? You know where I work, and you know what time I get off. If you're going to do it, come back and do it. Or shut up and leave. Don't call the cops. So they shut up and left. He never came back. I didn't have the heart to confess to my fellow, my fellow coworkers how much my knees have been knocking when I said that. I don't like cowardice. And if you add all those elements together, conspiracy theory, bullying, fear, greed, cowardice, you get Senator Joseph McCarthy. He had all those qualities and then some. Nothing that I think people want to emulate, although there are some that have tried really hard. So we had to ask the question, how did this guy come to power? How did he do what he did? And why, most of all, you see, because McCarthy is one thing. People like them have always, people like him have always existed and they will exist. So he's not really the mystery here. How you get a human being like that is not unusual. That's how human beings are cut, some of us. But the real question is, how is it that people in a democracy let this guy go on and do what he did for as long as he did it? One person putting a democracy under his heel under fear. How did the people let him get away with it? Why would we in a democratic republic that we cherish so much and our individual freedoms, why would we let one person run rush out of us for such a long period of time? Much of it has to do with context. So let's start talking about context. Context, as you know, can make all the difference in the world. Context can, 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 can bring understanding. Context deepens understanding and help us understand know why things happen, not when they happen, but also how they happen. October 1929, a wrecking ball comes to the U.S. economy that begins something they call the Great Depression, the drop of the stock market. It was a catastrophic time, a catastrophic time. I, you know, I tell my students, we never have enough time to talk about this because I say, you just cannot imagine the amount of fear and angst and anxiety and desperation that people felt were seeing their life savings go up in smoke, losing their homes. I tell you, the best thing I can give them is, you, you were probably little kids, but do you remember the Great Recession of 2008 to 2010? Do you remember their parents talking about that? Do you remember how people felt about that? I said, now multiply that by, I don't know, a thousand times, you have the Great Depression. I said, it's a different time in American history. It's a time in American history where, given the culture of the time, you know, many were the ones that went had the jobs that brought home the bacon. And the population was right around 150 million people, and 25% of the American workforce was out of work like that. Now, when 25% of the workforce of a small population is out of work like that, that means that it's more noticeable because there, there are fewer people. And since men were the ones that supposedly had the jobs that could take care of a family, that big of a bite out of the, pop, the working population means that in that time where men and patriarchy is what it is, men cannot live with themselves because there's something about going home and looking into the eyes of your wife who understands up here that it's not your fault that you lost your job. But down here is a different message. On the wedding day, you say you take care of us, me and the kids. You're not doing that. Men can't live with that. There's something in them that says they want to do this. They've been programmed to do that. They've been told us what, what they're supposed to do. Our entire Judeo-Christian ethics says that's what men are supposed to do. So what do they do? They took to the rails, back and forth across the country. Men simply walked up from their families and couldn't stand to look into the eyes of their wives and children that they could not take care of. So it became whole world culture. All nation and culture just being jostled. To and fro, because people are trying to find work. And I was, and this is this also should tell you 
about how different, de desperate things were. Because if the stock market crashes in 1929, and the trough, as, he, as some uh, economic historians say, the trough of the Great Depression, that is the worst, lowest part, was 1932, when FDR got elected. In other words, that was the year when people thought things could not get any worse, they can always get worse, we know that. That was the year the bonus marchers strike, the, the bonus marchers. The World War I veterans came to Washington, D.C., demanding that the government pay them their bonuses that they had been promised for fighting in World War I. And the U.S. Army was, led, was used to attack veterans. Herbert Hoover's approval ratings were already in the tank. They, were, they could barely recover after that. But you can tell from this picture that things were truly desperate because in this picture, the 1920s and 1930s, you see black and white men standing in line together. This is a time when black people are being lynched to the tune of about 150 people a year in extra legal activities and mob violence. So when black men and white men are standing in line together, not trying to tear each other apart, that means that whatever's going on with them is so large that for a moment they had to put their racial differences aside. That's how you, that's how you know that the Great Depression was terrible. Everybody was getting beat down. The people speak for themselves about what they're going through. Now, in 1929, when the stock market crashed, Vladimir Lenin had been dead for five years. And in the ensuing power struggle, Joseph Stalin comes to power. And by 1932, he's already on a, on a program of industrializing the Soviet Union, completely, in contra it, it completely uh, contradicting what Karl Marx said about a long, long process are going from agrarian to medieval to modern to industrial to socialism and communism. But by 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is elected in that hour of desperation. And he was in a landslide. He brings great hope, giving that first speech on his inaugural day about you know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, irrational, unbending fear. That's what, people been, that's what people have been looking to hear. They've not been looking to hear the fact that don't worry, it'll be okay eventually. Eventually, it's not enough, eventually it's not enough to feed me right now when I'm hungry. Because you know what? I'm hungry right now, not tomorrow. So Roosevelt unveils a series of programs called Roosevelt's Alphabet Soup, the Civilian Conservation Corps. If, you be, if, you, if you've ever gone walking on the South Haven Trail, the Cal Haven Trail down the South Haven, that was, a product, that was a product of the Rooseveltian Civilian Conservation Corps. There's a long trail in, in Ohio, just south of Toledo, where along the, along the uh, I forgot the name of the river, but there's also a lot, of, so see, a lot of CCC camps come up around the country that are still with us today and we're still benefiting from them. The AAA, they're not, not the AAA that we know of for cars, but the Agricultural Adjustment Administration the Public Works Administration, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation that saved a lot of investors recently when Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. The WPA, the Works Progress Administration, the National Youth Administration, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which continues to serve us today. The Social Security Act, the means of Americans have benefited from and have been contributing to and, have, and still are contributing to it. Now, many people saw what Roosevelt was doing as this expansion of government power, getting involved in the lives of Americans as being communist. Now, it wouldn't be the first time that that word had been used as a bludgeon to scare people. It was used in 1919 after World War I, in the midst of the Russians had the, the Bolshevik Revolution that occurred in 1917. But after the war ended, there was a civil war in Russia. There were some people from Michigan called the, the, uh, the polar bear soldiers who went to Russia uh, and with the British that invaded Russia, trying to stop the Russian, the Bolsheviks, from winning. So the Attorney General in 1919, Palmer, started going across the country, rounding up people, primarily Eastern Europeans or people that had, you know, Bolshevik or Slavic sounding names, and rounding them up and deporting them or interrogating them. It's a very strenuous kind of ways. And in 1938, the reaction to Roosevelt's New Deal program was the launching of something called the HUAC, the House and American Activities Committee, established in 1938. And its specific purpose was to investigate Roosevelt's New Deal programs. Because if you're convinced that the government getting involved and in providing work to people is just what a communist state would do, then this is to make sure 
to basically make sure that we know who these communist sympathizers were. So therefore, you set up a situation in the 1930s that people who are desperate, people who are looking for an alternative to unemployment and starvation and destitution and homelessness, you can very easily just label them a communist for the moment. And people, there will be some people, more than a few people, who will look at Joseph Stalin's Russia, you can believe this, and say, well, they're, they're industrializing. What do they know over there that we don't know over here? The rest of the world is in chaos and catastrophe, and they're actually moving forward. Now, they're moving forward with a lot of loss of life, blood and pain and misery, but they're moving forward. So what does he know over there that we don't know over here? It must be a communist plot. And then, of course, the following year, the two characters on the right, particularly the one with the swastika on his arm. In 1939, warfare breaks out in Europe. For the second time in a generation, Europe is going to be is going to fall into the cataclysm of a world war. And the character on the far right, Hideki Tojo, will see his plans come to fruition when the Americans attack uh, are attacked on December 7th, 1941, at Pearl Harbor. Now, at the start of World War II, the Germans will invade the eastern half of Poland, the Russians will take the western half of Poland will take the western half of Poland, eastern half that is, and you all know, as I said, that the Pacific War started December 7th, 1941. So the four horsemen of the apocalypse have seized control of the world one more time. On the Allied side of the conflict are the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. As one author has said, you couldn't have found three more unlikely characters to be working together. The world's largest capitalist power, with the world's largest colonial power, with the world's largest socialist communist power. But there they were having a common enemy called the Nazis. Victories achieved in 1945 and May in, in Europe, and then on September 2nd in the Pacific. And for a moment, a very exceedingly, impossibly, ridiculously brief moment, there appears, there appears to be a moment of trust and cooperation between the Russians on the right and the Americans here on the left. Now, the thing to understand about the Russians, do you notice that guy on the, on the, on the right, you have the Ukrainian flag behind him? The thing to recognize about the Russians at the end of World War II is that by the end of World War II, meaning from the end of Stalingrad, meaning February 1943, the Russians were not just in a bad mood, they were in exceedingly bad mood. With the way the Nazis had savaged the Russian people during World War II, when German soldiers were wounded and went back to Germany at all, in many cases, if they were allowed to go back, they were given instructions not to talk to anybody about what had been happening on the Eastern Front. Now, husbands are going to talk to their wives. So you're going to talk to their mothers and their girlfriends or their sisters. So the word got out about the savaging on the Eastern Front, and people in Germany figured out correctly, but if the Russians ever did to the German people what had been done to them, there's going to be some serious hell to pay. And as it was, there was hell to pay. 50 million people lost their lives in the European war. 20 million of those were Russian. So the Soviets all by themselves lost nearly half of what the war claimed. Joseph Stalin throughout the war never fully trusted Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. He kept asking both of them, where's my second front? Where's my second front? Because in his mind, the Western powers to include the Americans and the British were simply letting the Germans do the work for them we are trying to literally bleed the Russian people so they could be taken over by the West. The Russians have always had a worry about being taken over by the West, all the way back to the time of Peter the Great. So when the Allies land in North Africa, and then they invade Sicily, then Italy, and Churchill's talking about opening up a second front or going for the soft underbelly of Europe, Stalin's like, what are you talking about? The soft underbelly of Europe is down there. Russia's right here. Where are you? The answer to that question comes on June 6, 1944, when they land at Normandy. And then that ridiculously short moment of trust and cooperation ended with the beginning of a thing called the Cold War. That last, if you can believe this, from 1946 to 1991, 45 years, a half a century, uh, waiting for the next war to start, hoping that it doesn't, sitting on pins and needles. I was trying to tell my students yesterday that 
No, just like sadly, children that today have to learn to live with lockdown drills and evacuation drills because of school shootings. I said, during, during the time that I grew up, we were doing what they call the nuclear bomb drills, hiding up under desk and so forth. And, 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 and all those kind of things, you know, how, how to run. I lived on an Air Force base, so you had to run outside into the bunker. The ridiculous part was when I joined the Marine Corps and the drill instructor said, don't worry about it. In the event of a tactical nuclear weapon, just drink, get down to your foxhole and put your poncho over you and you'll be okay. I said, you mean like the poncho, like the raincoat? He went, yes. So that night in the foxhole, I told my foxhole man, I said, I think somebody's blowing smoke up our rear ends. Joseph Stalin was no joke. Joseph Stalin was responsible for one of the world's worst man-made famines in the 1930s called the Holodomor, where millions of Ukrainian citizens, I try to tell the students all the time that the Ukrainians are not just fighting for independence today, they're obviously fighting for that, but they're also fighting for what happened in the past too. They've had experience with the Russians, and they know what the Russians are willing to do to achieve their ends. They're willing to kill millions of people to achieve their ends. It's not imaginary, it's not a possibility, they've done it. So they're fighting for it. It's an existential crisis with them. Now, in February 1946, Joseph Stalin goes before a group of people, the, the Politburo, I believe, and makes something that's called the Bolshoi speech. You've heard of the Bolshoi, the Bolshoi ballet? They call this the Bolshoi speech. And in this speech, Joseph Stalin essentially says a lot of stuff that sounds very hostile. He essentially blames the West for all the misery that the Russians have undergone in recent history. And technically, he's not wrong. Germany was a Western power. The fact that they were run by the Nazis is kind of incidental to the fact that the attack came from the West to the Russian people. And for three and a half years, they lived in an absolute nightmare under the Nazis who had in that Mr. Einsatzgruppen, that is the killing, the killing squads that went around specifically. Their only mission was to hunt down Soviet Jews or guerrillas or anybody who's Slavic and murder them, men, women, and children. The Einstein's group, and if you're taking notes, there's a book entitled Ordinary Men by Christopher Browning that details this for police battalion number 101. They weren't the 18 to 35 year olds, so those are not the people who are, would be on the front line fighting the, the, the hard battles. These are the guys who are 35 or older. They're, you know, they're, they're not too old to fight, but they're still not, the Germans don't think they're good enough to be on the front line, so they give them another, another job, assassination of civilian populations. And that's what they do for three years. So Stalin's recalling all that, you know, from the Great Patriotic War. The Great Patriotic War is what, it was what he called it, because when they said defend communism, nobody answered to that. They experienced that. That was a, that's not appealing at all. He said, defend Stalin? No, you're, the, you're, our, you're, you're our murderer. But when he, just said, when he said defend Mother Russia, that's different. Mother Russia gave birth to them. Mother Russia sustained them. Mother Russia took care of them. Mother Russia was they're tied to it. The mother of Russia, Dostoevsky, they understand that part. So they can fight for Mother Russia. Now, an American diplomat, George Frost Kennan, George F. Kennan is a hero of mine as far as the Foreign Service goes. George, George F. Kennan had been one of the longest serving diplomats in Russia up to that point and eventually became the ambassador, the American ambassador to Russia. When he heard the speech by Stalin, he, read, he wrote a letter back to his bosses in Washington, D.C. It was a 10, 000, eight to 10,000 word letter called The Long Telegram. And in that letter, George Frost Kennedy said a lot of stuff about increasing Soviet hostility, the fact that they meant to expand their empire, spread communism, continue the revolution, et cetera, and so on. But in that letter, he advised that the best thing to do for the American government was to contain the Russians wherever, and, and deal with the Russians. So containment became pretty much the central point, no matter, no matter where it showed up, Korea, Vietnam, the Horn of Africa, Central America, under Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Reagan, Carter, all presidents, at some point or another, whatever their individual policies were per administration, they all used containment as the ultimate goal of making sure that where the Russians went, we had to be there. If they come here, we go there. So if they're in Eastern Europe, they're not going to Eastern Europe. They're not there, but the main goal is to make sure they don't creep anymore into Western Europe. Go to Africa, you meet them there. They go to Central America, you meet them there. They go to Asia, you meet them there. In Korea, in Vietnam, in Laos, in Cambodia. Go to Central Asia, Afghanistan, you meet them there as well. Contain the Russians. So a lot of it's going to be through proxy warfare. So it's an environment. From 1945 to 1990, Kennedy gives his advice in 1946. And it appears... 
that the communists are on the move, and they are. They're all sitting still. And it appears by 1950 or 47, 48, that Joseph Stalin has got an iron grip on all of Europe, at least all of Eastern Europe. And before long, there'll be a theory of foreign policy that will develop and people will begin banding about called the domino theory. If one country falls, another will fall in Asia. How do they know that? Because it happened in Eastern Europe. When the Russians, one of Mr. Neff, my ninth grade teacher, said to, said to us that wherever the Russia, wherever the Red Army went down to, they stayed. The Americans went places invaded, liberated, they went home. Americans wanted to get back to normal. The Russians had been invaded in 1812, then in World War One, then in 1941. They were not about to have another invasion. So now you know, this time you gotta come through Romania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Yugoslavia. By the time you get to us, you should be thoroughly exhausted. So the T-34s are ring of them when Eastern Europe. That wasn't planned for. Nineteen forty seven, but nineteen forty seven, with communists and communism looking more and more aggressive, the House Un American Activities Committee, you remember that? In nineteen thirty eight, now it's nine years later. It's nine years later. And keep in mind, just to, to further establish the context, nine years later, you got you got American policymakers and also European policymakers who have lived through a time of history where they have seen the entire world now knows that Neville Chamberlain came back from Munich in 1938 with a piece of paper around after negotiations with Hitler, where even the Czech ambassador was not invited to the meeting. They were the lot the French foreign minister and the, the, the British prime minister, Neville Chamberlain went and had a meeting where they basically gave away the Sudetenland as a German demand. German citizens, a German speaking minority in southern Czechoslovakia is being harassed. And if you don't, if you do not meet our demand, well, we're going to, have to do something. Every one of the one generation knew what that meant. They could not afford to let that happen again. All this is connected together. The world, the world, the one generation remembers what happened in and in the world in human history. They understood that in that moment of night, by December 1914, the entire Western Front knew that something had happened that they were not prepared for. Keep in mind like this. In 1914, now one of those leaders in 1914, uh, either military or political. Most of them have been born in the mid to late eight, 19th century. These are not 21st or 20th century people. So most of these men had no experience at all in how to conduct a modern war, especially a modern war that's going to make use of the machine gun, the airplane, the tank, the submarine, and gas. Five brand new weapon systems that if you use any one of them, would have been devastating enough. But these all five in the same conflict, humanity comfortable. You simply did not have the cognitive preparation to deal with that. Let me, put it to you, let, me, let me bring it up today for you. The same way that soldiers in World War II, liberated the death camps, had not been prepared for what they were going to see at Auschwitz, or Birkenau, or Bergen-Belsen, or Ordre, or Buchenwald. There's nothing in the experience of an American soldier in 1944, 1945, this prepared them to see industrialized killing on the scale that the Nazis did it. We should not be at all surprised that those men coming home from World War II were catatonic and didn't speak about it for decades. Put that stuff to the What are you supposed to say? The people, the people who are not like that, you have to protect for yourself. So the war has seen dictators come to power and inflict massive punishment upon each other. They tried to avoid it because of World War I. World War I generation understood that they had done something truly unforgivable. They called that the war in the war. This is so bad, that's why it's so rough for them. The World War I generation, human beings generally are about 75, 75 is behind themselves. You know, when President Kennedy was assassinated, they said, well, we'll unlock all the secrets about the investigation 100 years from now, because it's classified. So that all the people who are alive there will be definitely dead. Well, the, the World War I generation said, we know right now, today, that this war is so devastating. It is so chaotic. It is so costly. We simply cannot do this again. So he called it. He said, we are saying right now in 1914, 1915, 
this must be the war to end all wars. They said that then. That's how much, that's how aware they were. That's how bad it was. They finally said, you don't have to wait 75 years to get it. That generation lived through that. Then they saw the rise of Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo. Then they went through it again. And now, here they are in the same lifetime, they're dealing with another dictator, Joseph Stalin, and another international bully, communism. So the world is primed to not wait this time for another global conflagration. And since we waited the last time, we figured out that if you wait to fight a bully, it's only going to cost you more the next time. So when things about communism start circulating, start circulating people are already on edge about the threats internationally. In Washington, the fear of communist subversive activities has developed into hysterical frenzy, which grows daily. Appointed by Congress to investigate, Chairman Parnell Thomas opens the hearing. He's investigating alleged communist influence and infiltration in the moving picture industry must not be considered or interpreted as an attack on the industry itself. The first of the screen stars to testify before the Committee on Un-American Activities is veteran actor Adolf Marshall. Once known as the screen's best-dressed man, he states... The Communist Party in the United States should be outlawed by the Congress of the United States. It is not a political party. It's a conspiracy to take over our government by force, which would enslave the American people as the Soviet government, 14 members of the Politburo, hold the Russian people in abject slavery. The court is packed with fashionably dressed women, as witness Robert Taylor takes the stand. In answer to a committee question on whether the Communist Party should be outlawed in America, Mr. Taylor replies, I personally certainly do believe that the Communist Party should be outlawed. However, I'm not an expert on politics or of what the reaction would be. If I had my way about it, they'd all be sent back to Russia or some other unpleasant place. Well, what if they didn't come from Russia? What if they were Americans? What about that, Robert Taylor? Well, That was 1947 when the House Un-American Activities Committee begins its investigation. And then what happens, you know, that at the end of World War II, Germany was divided into four zones, the Soviet zone in the red there, and also because of the wartime agreements, I don't, I don't know if it was a Yalta or Potsdam, but one of the wartime conferences toward the end, it was agreed by the Allies that because the Russian people had suffered so much that they will be given the honor of seizing Berlin. So you can see that Berlin is deep inside of the Soviet sector. In the red, you see the multicolored little dot there? That's Berlin. Divided just like Germany, the nations divided between the Russians, the French, the British, and the Americans. So also, Berlin was divided between the Russians, the French, the British, and the Americans. And in 1947, 1948, the Russians decided that because so many people were trying to escape from East Berlin into West Berlin, from the Soviet sector into the American, French, or British sector, they blocked off access to West, to West Berlin, and they eventually blocked off road access to West Germany. Well, <laughs> if you're not going to allow people to bring in by truck or by rail, food, fuel, clothing, the, you know, the things people need to have to live, then they had only one of the alternatives. If you need to have the people in West Berlin not die of starvation, they had one choice, that was to airlift it in. So from 1947 to 1940, 1948 to 1949, something happened called the Berlin Airlift. Well, around the clock, and I mean around the clock, that is in sometimes within minutes of landing, C-54, C-47 cargo planes were landing for a year, bringing supplies that people needed in West Berlin. And this was a public relations nightmare for the Russians. People who wondered, there were people inside of Roosevelt's cabinet inherited by Harry Truman after Roosevelt died in the spring of 1945, who absolutely hated Stalin and never thought that Roosevelt should have trusted him in the first place. This proved their point, that Stalin was a man who was ruthless, who would do anything to get his way, who was oppressive, who was enslaving people. So all of this feeds into the narrative of communism and slavery and world conquest and so on. This was a terrible convergence of activities or events. So this goes on for a whole year. Then in 1948, the hysteria takes a new, goes to a new level. This man right here, Whitaker Chambers, 
was a senior editor at Time Magazine, was called by the House Un-American Committee on Un-American Activities to corroborate the testimony of one Elizabeth Bentley, a Soviet spy. Now, Elizabeth Bentley was a real spy for the Russians. So Whitaker Chambers was called upon to corroborate some information that had been found about her. She defected in 1945 and accused dozens of members of the U.S. government of espionage, and she named one particular, one particular diplomat, especially Audrey Hiss, as being possibly connected to the USSR. Now, a little bit about Whitaker Chambers. I, yeah, you'll figure it out for yourself. If Alger Hiss's life seemed like a stately progress towards perfection, Chambers was a zigzagging, god-awful mess, but always in search of a higher truth. It's going to take longer to tell than Hiss's because it was much more complicated and I think much more interesting. I've already described his sad, sick family. Chambers escaped from it by immersing himself in 19th century romantic novels, especially Dostoevsky and Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. His uh, hygiene was so poor that his schoolmates called him chamber pot and stinky. He was so physically clumsy that he couldn't even play marbles. He ran away from home for two years in his mid-teens, but by the end of high school in 1919, his brilliance won him the position of class valedictorian. His valedictory speech was unforgettable because in it he predicted that one of his female classmates would become a prostitute. Even as a boy, he did not, he, managed to sort of rise high in organizations and then break the rules in some scandalous way. Later that same year, he ran away from home again and lived in New Orleans French Quarter in a rooming house where his next door neighbor was a prostitute named One-Eyed Annie. Uh, Chambers returned north and entered into Williams College in 1920. He skipped a gathering of the freshman class, uh, staying instead in his room reading the Bible. And he left Williams after a few days because he said it was uh, too high class for him. Um, his, Is it his roommate for that uh, Wicker Chambers has some problems? He's going to be a key witness for the investigation. Now, look, you all can read all that. Um, Alger Hiss had a, had a distinguished career before all this happened. He was with FDR Yalta. At the time this is all occurring, he was 41 years old. He had been a leading player in the establishment of the United Nations. In 1946, he was elected to the presidency of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Alger Hiss, rather, Alger Hiss's star as an American public servant was rising quickly. But when Elizabeth Bentley teamed up with Whitaker Chambers, suddenly Alger Hiss was on the defensive and found his whole career in jeopardy. Now, when it's in 1947, 1946, 47, into the 1948 presidential election, and let's face it, if it's a presidential election in 1946, 1947, we know that during the Korean War, there'll be a lot of stuff going on and then during the Korean War, especially, or well, even more so when, when Eisenhower runs for office, he's like, the Democrats lost Korea, the Democrats lost China. No political party has the, a ballot, the ability to hold on to a country, or to lose a country for that matter, but it makes good, it makes good politics in America, so Chambers is, is accusing Alger Hiss of being a member of the Communist Party. They both had been at one time, or he's been to a few meetings. Why had they been? Because during the 1930s, when a lot of people did go to the Communist parties or sort of meetings, that's what people were doing in the 1930s. Why? Because of the Depression. They were desperate. They weren't going to check, going to actually join, but people were desperate. They were seeking a solution, an alternative, because capitalism everywhere from 1929 to 1938, looked like it had failed, and not just failed, but failed miserably. It was called the Great Depression. So of course, people were serious looking for alternatives. So people who would have gone to a meeting one time, two times, or joined, and then gotten out by the 1940s, their brief membership or going to that meeting, all was meaning something different. Do you follow what I'm saying? On the mere instance of having heard of something, but then this paragon of virtue and truth telling, They pretty much had his nailed to the wall. 
Let me just read here. It could have ended there, but members of the committees, especially then California Congressman Richard Nixon, prided Chambers into disclosing information, suggesting there was more to his story and his relationship with his. He divulged a lot of stuff about Alger Hiss, but he kept probing and probing and probing until they finally got down to something called the pumpkin patch confessions. Alger Hiss, former high state departmental official, is branded a communist spy by an American jury after a sensational trial. It began 18 months ago when his accuser, Whitaker Chambers, self-confessed former communist, testified before the Un-American Affairs Committee. Mr. Hiss represents the concealed enemy against which we are all fighting and I am fighting. I have testified against him with remorse. and pity. On oath, his contradicts the evidence of Chambers on almost every point. The 45-year-old Harvard-educated American names 34 prominent people whose confidence he enjoyed. They include Presidents Roosevelt and Truman, State Secretaries Burns and Atchison. Says he, Ask them if they ever found in me anything except the highest adherence to duty and honor. Then the committee can judge and the public can judge whether to believe a self-discredited accuser whose names and aliases are as numerous and as casual as his accusations. The undocumented statements of the man who now calls himself Whitaker Chambers. Is he a man of consistent reliability, truthfulness, and honor? Clearly not. He admits it and the committee knows it. At the first trial, the jury disagreed. At the second, it... Scholars of Hasp, does this sound familiar to you? A person of questionable character makes allegations that you have to prove or disprove a negative, which is always difficult to do. Charges that can't be substantiated. There's not even any evidence. Just on the basis of the word of the individual and the willingness to want to believe what they say, to be accused and to be guilty, innocent till guilty, till proven guilty notwithstanding, which is supposed to be the standard of the law, the law. It gets more interesting. Prominent Americans with whom he worked, including Senators Vandenberg and Connolly, and former State Secretaries Hall, Statinius, and Burns. Ask them if they ever found in me anything. Now, except the highest. Arthur Vandenberg is from our area. He's from Grand Rapids. He's the one that's credited with building, essentially, what became American foreign policy after World War II. So Arthur Vandenberg was also being implicated in all, all of this. He's eventually admitted that he had been associated with the Communist Party in the 1930s, but he continued to deny any ties to communism and later filed a libel suit against Whitaker Chambers, who, you know, that didn't go very far. But then Richard Nixon found something that produced documents showing that he and his had been committing espionage. Chambers provided the committee with a package of microfilm and other information that he had hidden inside a pumpkin patch, a pumpkin on his Maryland farm. You can't make this up. The pumpkin contained, contained images of State Department material, including notes in his own handwriting. Now, now keep in mind, at this, at this particular time, Richard Nixon is a junior senator, or rather junior congressman, He's trying to make a name for himself. So, and, and to his credit, Richard Nixon is a Cold War. I mean, the Cold War is a real thing. So he's not imagining the Cold War. He's imagining things about the Cold War, but he's not imagining the conflict itself. He's got a name that he, he, he's got a career in politics and he wants to make a name for himself. And this is an issue that apparently has traction at the time. So Algin was charged with perjury. He could not be indicted for espionage, but there were a statute of limitations there. The FBI continued their investigation, and <clears throat> there's more revelations about Hiss's cover-ups. Later on, Alger Hiss would say the following. Were you ever a communist spy, Mr. Hiss? No, I was not. Neither a communist, nor a spy, nor both again. Alger Hiss's political career came to an end in 1950, when he was convicted of perjury. 
The man who was mainly responsible for his conviction, the hitherto little known Richard Nixon, is now President of the United States. America first heard of Alger Hiss in the late summer of 1948, when Whittaker Chambers, a confessed ex-communist, appeared before that watchdog of the American way of life, the Un-American Activities Committee. He dramatically announced the names of fellow communists in the government service he'd operated with in the 30s. One of those was Alger Hiss. John Hap became the leader. Lee Pressman was also a member of this group. So, Alger Hiss is, up to that point, very promising career, was done. Now keep in mind, let's, let's do a quick review. World War II ends and very quickly, Soviet-American cooperation militarily collapses. Then Joseph Stalin gives his Bolshoi speech in 1946. George Frost Kennedy recommends containment. In 1947, the House Un-American Activities Committee begins its investigation into people who have been associated with the Communist Party. Many people were in the 1930s, as I've mentioned. Algin Hiss becomes known to people because of allegations made by Whitaker Chambers, corroborated by a one-time admitted Soviet spy who defected and was willing to corroborate what Whitaker Chambers was saying. So the environment's already well-textured to believe this kind of stuff. And it doesn't help that the Russians have blockaded West Berlin and the Allies have had to respond with a, with a one-year airlift. And one year is enough time for everybody to know what's going on and to be convinced that the Russians are a clear and present danger. Communism must be a threat. Look at this. They're trying to starve innocent civilians who have already been bombed into oblivion by World War II. Now they're going to starve them into further misery by denying them food that they need to live daily, of course, fuel that they need in the wintertime. And this is in a bombed out Berlin, which has seen more than a share of misery from 1933 to 1945. Twelve years. And the Russians are going to do this. What kind of people are these? And then in 1949, the Soviets, through a spy network that ran from North America through Canada back to Russia, got the technology to explode their first atomic device, which meant that the American nuclear monopoly was over. We'd had it for just about three and a half years. And then in 1949, also, Mao Zedong, who had been having a multi-decade, and multi a long, long civil war, fighting against Chiang Kai-shek on mainland China, kick the nationalists off of, China, off of mainland China onto Formosa. Today, you know it as Taiwan. It's called Formosa because that's what the Portuguese called it when they discovered it. It appeared then. Now, the communist Chinese have mainland China, which means that they have mainland China, they have, May, they have Manchuria and Mongolia as well. Tibet and Nepal are going to be threatened. The nationalist Chinese under Chiang Kai-shek have been American allies during World War II. The American allies during World War II, people like Claire Chenault, the Flying Tigers, the China Burma India Theater that had been used to anchor 1.2 million Japanese troops that would have otherwise been on those islands as Americans were, go, were, out, were hopping from one island to another to try to get to Japan. All that had changed. And by 1950, the map of the world covered in red was looking very, very bleak indeed. All of the Soviet or Russian Far East, all of Russia, obviously, Central Asia, meaning Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Eastern Europe, Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Bulgaria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Eastern Germany, Eastern Europe under the Soviet bloc. And then even as you get into the 1950s, eventually the Horn of Africa with Ethiopia, Somalia, the Ogaden region, parts of the Middle East, North and South Yemen will be divided, even Madagascar and Southwest Africa, Angola. All these areas, they're going to have communist influence and to the south of America, Florida, many miles of the Florida coast, Cuba will eventually be taken over by Castro. This map says that a lot's going on in the world, but it doesn't imply, it doesn't, re, it doesn't give a message that communism is not on the move, literally conquering different parts of the earth. And worse, worse yet, they're in the Western Hemisphere. Cuba may be an island, but that's what people said back then. They get one, then another one, then another one, they would fall like dominoes, the domino theory. Do you follow what's going on? The environment was right for an opportunist to come along and exploit people's fears, yet you need the right kind of coward who is greedy enough 
who are used to enough to take this situation and use it to their advantage. Not the nation's advantage, but their advantage. On January 21st, 1950, Al Jahis was sentenced to five years in prison. And if, if that map were indicting enough of communist movement around the world, something else is going to happen in 1950 that will convince people that the communists absolutely were aggressive and intent upon taking over the world. Now, it's said that in politics, never let a good crisis go to waste. And what was coming? And if there's anybody who would practice this, never let, never let a good crisis go to waste, it will be Senator Joseph R. McCarthy of Wisconsin. Now, when he first went to Congress, he, you know, he, he, he overturned an election in Wisconsin because he beat a guy named Robert La Follette. Now, La Follette was one of those old world, what they call progressive Republicans. In the early part of the 20th century, people like La Follette, Theodore Roosevelt, remember Theodore Roosevelt was the one that was a big conservationist, setting aside millions of acres of land for conservation, hiking and camping and all that kind of stuff. That was Ro Roosevelt, the Republican, did that. Rob, Bob La Follette was also in Wisconsin looking at the meatpacking industry, you know, labor laws, all that kind of stuff. The Republicans have not always been who they are right now. Now, so the Republican Party would have been at the front end of progressive politics in the early 20th century. So when this guy beat La Follette, who was a favorite son of Wisconsin, truly liked by Bob La Follette, had let, let's say he got calcified in office. So McCarthy came along with a new, vigorous voice. And just let me read right here. The Saturday evening post heralded McCarthy's arrival with an article entitled, The Senator, The Senate's Remarkable Upstart. For the next three years, McCarthy searched for an issue that would substantiate his remarkableness. In other words, he went to Congress on a great, you know, tide of hope. This guy's going to do something, going to get there and change the world. He got there and nothing happened. He was just a lackluster, just another politician in Congress. Because, you know, there's not enough of those. So people, people began to wonder, you know, we see this guy there with a big mandate to do different things. What is he doing to do? You know, what, what, who is he? What's he doing there for us? So McCarthy was not unaware of that. And he was searching for a reason, searching for a cause, searching for something to give himself a name and legitimate, justify his existence there. And more than that, to accrue power unto himself. And he found it in February. Now listen, on the grand scale of cosmic timing, this could not have been any worse. It's February 1950. In February 1950, <laughs> Jim McCarthy's gonna go, you'll see this in the clip I'm gonna play in a minute. He's gonna go to William, West Virginia, and in the middle of a speech, he's gonna pull out a sheet of paper and say, I have on this sheet of paper, the names of 250 known communists in the State Department. Now, in that kind of environment, internationally, at that moment in time, after everything that I shared with you all, this was a lightning rod. And he knew exactly how to use it and where to point it. Every Lincoln's birthday, the Republican Party holds its special Lincoln Day dinners addressed by a major politician if they can get one. As Republicans are celebrating in 1950, their big guns are being sent to Chicago and New York and Los Angeles. And you can get an idea of what Joe McCarthy's status at that moment was, that they sent him to the Women's Republican Club in Wheeling, West Virginia and no offense to Wheeling, West Virginia, the person who gets sent there to talk is the person at the bottom of the totem pole. Joe McCarthy's Senate career from 1946 until 1950 is one of repeated failure. No one is expecting him to win re-election. So what is most extraordinary here is that the most important speech in some ways of that generation is given in a place where there is a sense by the people who sent him there that nobody really cares what he has to say or is going to listen very hard. 
The expectation was that McCarthy was going to give a standard boilerplate speech that you give to uh, you know, Republican constituency. In Wheeling, West Virginia, they really weren't sending him there to make headlines. He comes out and says that there are 205 communists in the State Department. Well, that's electrifying. It's so electrifying that people are almost distracted from the question of who these communists are, whether they actually exist, why does McCarthy know this and other people don't? It's, in a way, a kind of brilliant speech. We are the most powerful country in the world. We're the most influential country in the world. And yet, we're losing everywhere. We're losing in Asia. We're losing in Europe. We're losing technologically now to the Soviets. How do we explain this? And what McCarthy does in Wheeling is to explain it by waving a list saying, we are being sold out by traitors. Joe McCarthy is traveling through the United States on his Lincoln Day tour, and reporters keep coming up to him. Say, Joe, do you really have the numbers? Are there really that many communists? And Joe would say, well, you know, let me go through my papers. Uh, I think we've got some names for you. He realized he had a thing going. He'd found his shtick at last. He called back to his office and he asked his secretary, are we getting any publicity? And she said, we're getting a lot of publicity. His secretary described him as being almost intoxicated with the joy and excitement of getting this much attention for a story. What is really interesting about Wheeling is that it takes a while for it to sink in. Once the attention starts to mount, the public really began to sort of link on to the fact that, oh my God, this guy's done his research. This guy has names, this guy has numbers. He has really gone in and scrupulously looked for information. He's doing research. McCarthy had no list in his hand. He had nothing in his hand. And it was a fraud. Scholars of Hash, does that sound familiar to you? Make a false claim, provide no evidence, and then it's circulated through that day's media. Today we call it social media. The media played play their part, the American people played their part, and unscrupulous politicians played their part. The one bright spot during this time was on June 1st, 1950, and it came through one courageous senator. Her name was Margaret Chase Smith. If ever there were a woman of integrity and courage, it was Margaret Chase Smith. She took over from her husband after he died in 1940, as a representative in the House, as a, in serving in the House of Representatives, and she was elected five times, on, four times on her own. Then in 1948, she was elected to the Senate, and eventually came into the Senate with Joe McCarthy. They both were junior senators. And then McCarthy made his willing speech. Now, Margaret Chase Smith in 1950 is in an unusual position. She's a woman senator. And Beyond the fact that in 1950, people thought that women shouldn't, have been, shouldn't be in the Senate, she now has to do something which is act on her conscience, which is speak, speak out against Joe McCarthy. She read the statement reluctantly that he's going to, that he's going to, make, to make in the Senate. And she said the more she read and listened to McCarthy, the less comfortable she felt. There were questions about the validity, accuracy, credibility, and fairness of his charges. In other words, where's the proof? Where's the evidence? You're making 205 people, 200 some odd people. Where do you have a single name? People encouraged her to take a stand, including the famous newspaper columnist, Walter Lippmann. Now, in their time, Walter Lippmann would have been their day's Walter Cronkite. Same way Con Cronkite goes to Vietnam during the Tet Offensive and then comes back and tells the American people, at a time when they simply just gave you the news, not opinion news, when the story's all about them, but just the news. 
the rare occasion Walter Cronkite comes back and says, Vietnam cannot be won, essentially. And Lyndon Johnson, so the story goes, was he heard that night, that night in the executive quarters, he said, if I lost Cron Cronkite, I've lost middle America. I can't fight a war and win without middle America. And you can't. You shouldn't be able to. See, send the other people's children to die. Walter Lippmann said, true opinions can prevail only if the facts to which they refer are known. If they are not known, false ideas are just as effective as true ones, if not a little more effective. We cannot fight the, un we cannot fight the untruth with envelopes which envelop envelops us by parading our around our opinions. We can do it only by reporting the facts, and we do not deserve to win if the facts are against us. On June 1st, 1950, Margaret Chase Smith said, as a United States Senator, I am not proud of the way in which the Senate has been made a publicity platform for irresponsible sensationalism. I am not proud of the reckless abandon in which, it un in which unproved charges have been hurled from this side of the aisle. I am not proud of the obviously staged undignified countercharges which have been attempted in, re in retaliation from the other side of the aisle. I do not like the way the Senate has been made a rendezvous for vilification for selfish political gain at the sacrifice of individual reputations and national unity. I am not proud of the way we smear outsiders from the floor of the Senate and hide behind the cloak of congressional immunity and still place ourselves beyond criticism on the floor of the Senate. Would that there were one such leader today, just one. If World War II brought the four horsemen of the apocalypse, conquest, war, famine, and death, what McCarthy was about to unleash upon the American people in the way of his, I use the word very loosely here, investigations, with the Un-American Activities Committee as his front, his cover. After World War II, many Americans feared that the spread of communism was threatening freedom and democracy. The countries of Eastern Europe had turned to communism and communist forces were advancing in East Asia. In the United States, hearings by the House Committee on Un-American Activities and Espionage Cases in the Courts increased fears that communism was spreading at home. On June 1, 1950, as another Red Scare was sweeping the nation, Margaret Chase Smith, a freshman senator from Maine, stood alone on the Senate floor to protest the smear tactics being used against American citizens in the fight against communism. I am not proud of the reckless abandon in which unproved charges have been hurled from this side of the aisle. I don't want a democratic administration whitewashed or cover up any more than I want a Republican smear or witch hunt. Smith's Declaration of Conscience speech was aimed at fellow Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy, who had recently claimed he held a list of communists working in the State Department. And his accusations continued. The communists and defense plans uh, communists were there as of this month. As McCarthy ignored requests for evidence to back his claims, Smith urged caution. I believe with all my heart that we must not become a nation of mental mutes, blindly following demagogues. Smith spoke out at a time when few dared to publicly speak against McCarthy's tactics. In a 19... We must not blindly follow demagogues. When I said that you couldn't have found a more unfortunate convergence of cosmic timing, McCarthy makes his allegations about communists in the State Department in February. Margaret Chase, Margaret Chase Smith makes a declaration of conscience in June 1950. And then in June 1950, North Korea attacks South Korea. It couldn't have happened at a worse time. A man who's making allegations that communists are everywhere. They're losing on the home front, we're losing on the international front, and then the North Koreans literally attack South Korea. You would, have to, you would have been extremely courageous 
to argue that South Korea was a one-off. How do you argue that communism is not aggressive? You see North Korea attacking South Korea, and more to the point, the North Korea, and it was backed by communist China and the Soviet Union. It appeared that everything that people were saying about the communists being an existential, a clear and present danger is true. Panel one shows the attack across the 38th parallel. Panel two shows North Korean forces driving UN and South Korean forces down into the Pusan perimeter, where they almost lost it. To the south and east in Japan, General Douglas MacArthur, the military governor, was ordered by Truman to stage a counterattack. They chose Inchon, an unpleasant, difficult to manage, erratic, unpredictable port for an amphibious landing. An amphibious landing is difficult on a good day. Inchon had unpredictable tides. They were channelized. They had heavy beach defenses. You could not get equipment, equipment ashore, establishing a beachhead, for ship to shore movement was next to impossible. Everybody on MacArthur's staff told him that. He said, yes, you're right. It's almost impossible to land there. You know that, and guess who else knows that? The North Koreans. They'll never see us coming. So they landed there. It caused the North Koreans to go back north. They had overextended supply lines. They attacked them, pushed them back across the 38th parallel, started moving north toward the Yellow River. It's a contiguous border with China. Now, Mao Zedong, I mentioned Mao Zedong, had just finished seizing mainland China in 1949. In 1949, Mao Zedong is not the overwhelming behemoth of dictatorship that he will be eventually. He says to consolidate power on mainland China. So in 1950, with the Americans and UN forces coming closer and closer to China, it's going to possibly interfere with his ability, his ability to put the final stranglehold on power inside of China. He cannot afford for that to happen. So by the time you get to late 1950, people in this country feel that the war is coming to a close, that they will, that maybe we'll be home by Christmas. It should look that way. MacArthur certainly was planning that. But then in November 1950, the Chinese came in on the side of the North Koreans. And what was going to be a war that would possibly end by Christmas Day or New Year's at the latest went into 1951, then 1952. Then 1953, and then finally a ceasefire in 1953, and it's been that way ever since. We are still technically in a state of war. You understand that warfare doesn't end until there's a peace treaty signed. What they have is a ceasefire agreement, which means exactly what it says. I won't shoot at you if you don't shoot at me. And I can assure you that they shoot at each other. My first commanding officer at Camp Lejeune told me that he spent about maybe six months in, in Korea. He said that when the Koreans are probing, trying to get into the South, and they're always probing, they're always trying to find a way. He said that one of the things that the South Koreans and the Marines and the, and the U.S. Army, the military forces are constantly looking for, the South Koreans dig tunnels. And they dig tunnels big enough for tractor trailers to go through. Not trailers, you know, a human being can crawl through. I'm talking about full-size trucks. So when they invade or come underground. So they're constantly digging and blowing tunnels up, stopping North Korean probing. And then... In 1954, South Korea is in a stalemate. This is something new for American military planners and the American military establishment. Ever since 1862, with the battle at Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, Americans have been used to ending wars unconditional. Unconditional surrender in Spanish-American War. Unconditional surrender in World War I. Germany, we won, you lost, you don't tell us what to do. There are no conditions. You lost our terms. Unconditional surrender of World War II. Japan, you lost. You come to the USS Missouri and sign the document or else. Germany, you lost the second time in Europe. Unconditional surrender. Unconditional surrender. Americans are used to winning unconditionally surrendered wars. What in 1953 is a ceasefire? A new term enters into the American lexicon or phraseology called limited war. What is a limited war? After two world wars, how do you fight a limited war? A war you fight not really? Or will you give a punch halfway? When you have nuclear weapons, can you afford to go all out in warfare? Because in 1945, we finally have mastered, have achieved the ability to have the weaponry to destroy the species. So what do you do with that? How do you fight an all out war where you can literally wipe yourself off the planet? So not winning unconditionally in Korea, 
for many people equates to a loss, which is why people will begin saying the Democrats said it's Truman lost Korea. Then in 1954, further to the south in Indochina, a place that you know called Vietnam, the French will be kicked out at a battle called Den Ben Phu. The French after World War II, having learned nothing about World War II, go back to Vietnam, to Indochina, to reassert the colonial power, and Ho Chi Minh, and his followers are saying like, no, you don't get it. It's not, the, it's not you that we hate. We don't want anybody, the Chinese, the Japanese, or you, dominating our country. We want to be free and independent. So they get kicked out of Den Ben Phu, and it appears one more time, Ho Chi Minh is a communist. He doesn't try to hide it. At the end of World War II, there was a conversation between Ho Chi Minh and an American officer who worked with the OSS, the Officer, officer of Strategic Services. The conversation was something like this. Well, the American officer who had been ordered from Indochina back to America asked Ho Chi Minh, are you a communist? Ho Chi Minh said, yes, I am. That doesn't mean we, see, we still can't be friends, does it? Ho Chi Minh is American and the OSS have been working to rescue American down pilots or working against the Japanese together during World War II. But now World War II is over. Ho Chi Minh says, yes, I'm a communist, but can we still work together? More than that, at the end of World War II in Vietnam, there was something established called the Vietnam, the Vietnam American Friends Association, a small organization of people that were looking forward to cooperating with the Americans. Talking about American investment in the country, what we can give to the Americans, what we can get from them, they wanted student exchanges. They saw a great cooperation, a great cooperative future with America in that period that lasted, that didn't last, obviously. So with North Korea at the 30th parallel and Vietnam at the 17th parallel, and the French move out, and now it's 1954. Dwight Eisenhower is in office in 1954. The domino theory appears to be underway. If they win in China, the next thing to fall will be Japan or the Philippines, Indochina, Thailand, Burma, India, Tibet. And Joe McCarthy, in that period of 1954 moving forward, will begin making allegations about people in the US government, begin making charges about communist infiltration to the point where we even implicate George Catlett Marshall. Now, you know, George C. Marshall was the spirit and the muscle behind something called the ERA, the European Recovery Act. You have probably heard of it as called the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was passed because at the end of World War II, with Europe, so much of Europe being devastated. And again, people who are hungry, people who are cold, people who are homeless, people whose children are crying and wanting to be fed and comforted at night, at night they're not, they may not be, they're, they're, their decision-making may not be as rational as we would like for it to be all the time. They're trying to find a way of surviving. And sitting over here, you know, in my comfortable situation in America, it may be very difficult for me to understand why somebody, some mother, you know, might listen to a, 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 a communist dictator say, look, I can do this for you. Or she wants to feed her child. It's not to explain it away, but just to get some understanding, again, context. So George Marshall and the Americans figure out that, you know what? We can either get Europe on our side or let, Europe, let them be taken over by these guys. So billions of dollars into Europe to help feed people, rebuild Europe. And by rebuilding Europe, it begins the first step of process that begins the formation of a tiny American economy with the North Atlantic community together to something called eventually the North Atlantic community. But for the Europeans, it's the European economic community, the EEC, that becomes the EU, the European Union, that thing that exists today, the EU. And it binds us together economically, it binds us together ethically, it binds us together morally, it binds us together as far as our values are concerned. It's American money going to Europe to tie them into the American system. And if they're leaning on us, and they're our, our ally, that means it's not their ally. So just like Stalin will have Eastern Europe under his domination, the Americans can have economic influence inside of Western Europe. And then because of all the other things going on in Europe in 1949, the Americans will lead the formation of something called NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which of course is Article 5, an attack upon one is considered an attack upon the other, and any one of them that's attacked necessitates a response by the others. 
The reason why the League of Nations failed in 1918 is because the Americans were worried about lack of sovereignty. After World War II, that discussion is not prominent anymore. We know what happens when you don't have interactive cooperation. But even George Marshall is accused of being a communist sympathizer. George Marshall, the former chief of staff of the U.S. Army. So Senator McCarthy will begin not just his attack on regular American citizens, people who are defenseless and can't save themselves, he begins attacking the American government itself, and particularly the U.S. Army, one branch of the military. And when he does this, as he's doing this, George Marshall, who at one time was Douglas MacArthur's boss, Dwight Eisenhower's boss, George Patton's boss, he was the boss, he was the Army Chief of Staff. So McCarthy will essentially blow up justice in America or kill justice with the law or inventing law. He will, he may essentially just basically have set the Constitution on fire. It does exist. If for some reason people will not grab the document and use it and not let him defile it. And the only question that we can ask today about what he did and for what's going on right now is why. Why did we let him do it? Why did we let him, why, why did we Why did we let more than one day go by with this guy doing this? This went on for years. Until finally, Joseph Walsh, as we, will see, as we shall see the next time, finally called him on it and it didn't take a whole lot. All it did was one man saying, Mr. McCarthy, you're a bully and a thug. You're dangerous to this republic. But it took one man one man, it's amazing how it's amazing how much it didn't take to stop the bully, because bullies at heart are cowards. And they will keep on doing what they do as long as you let them. Winston Churchill said that what is an appeaser? An appeaser is a an appeaser is someone who feeds a crocodile, hoping it will eat him last. Stop feeding the crocodile. I hate cowards and bullies because when I was growing up, I was bullied. I don't like them personally, and I don't like them internationally. Now, I solved my bullying problem by joining the wrestling team and lifting weights. No more bullying. But it did take one more fight from a bully with a bully before the word got out that I can't be bullied anymore. Then they wouldn't bully someone else. They didn't like. But at the moment, I had to stop the bullying for myself. You understand what I'm saying? I am convinced in my heart of hearts that bullies will do what they do, that people will do what they do. They will destroy this democracy, this democratic republic as long as we let them. The only question is how long are we going to let that happen? So that's not the only, that's the only question that matters right now. It will continue for as long as we let it. But to stop, just stop it. It's really simple. In half a mile, Blue John to Michigan 14 West, US 20. What are your questions? While you're thinking of a question or two, I should let you know that session two, Dr. Johnson has entitled, A Tragic Misuse of the Word Low Life for next week, referring to John McCarthy. Question do you have? I was going to apologize to the, to the student whose paper this belongs to, but given what's written on it, being crumpled up is appropriate. <laughs> Comments, question. What do you all? Yes, sir. Yes. When when McCarthy was discredited and, and rapidly fell from power, what what? Uh, tell us a little, a little bit about some about what uh, in what ways his campaign uh, continued in other in, uh, it was continued by other people and in other parts of American culture in the next. 10, 20 years. Well, one example that stands out, one example that stands out perfectly is Vietnam. You know, the, the, the fear of communism, particularly when it came to Vietnam, is what led was what led many people to support that war until we finally got to a point where clearly we should not have been supporting the war. Now, on the one hand, that's geo geostrategic and that 
Vietnam was, I mean, it was where a conflict was going on, but this notion that communism was out to take over the world was so strong. And I mean, to the people who were anti-communist, they weren't wrong to be anti-communist because you see communist infiltration in Africa, in Angola, I mean, Ethiopia and Somalia, depending upon what day of the week, they go back and forth, they're communist and they're not communist. So we had Somalia as an ally, then the Russians had Ethiopia as an ally, then we had Ethiopia as an ally, and so on and so on and so forth, all right? The same thing, and don't even get started about the Middle East, they're there as well. The Suez crisis in 1956. So this 45 year standoff with the Soviet Union, where people were definitely concerned about communism, and the fact that we had you know, an arms race, and they talked about a missile gap, all these things fed into the narrative that had people still latching on to this whole notion of communism is out to take over the world. And in many ways it either was, or it simply didn't try, didn't do enough to convince people otherwise. And McCarthy's legacy simply stoked that fire to such a high point to where it was gonna take a long time to die off. And we'll lose, as you all know, we'll lose 58,000 warriors in Vietnam. The, the irony about Vietnam among other things is Sending people, sending poor white kids and poor brown kids to fight in Vietnam for freedom and liberty and democracy, and they can't get a hamburger at home in Mississippi. Now, another way that communism is very useful and the legacy of that is that it will continue, it will continue to be used in presidential politics as well. Even, in, even into the administration of Richard Nixon that we talked in this discussions about who lost what country, who's responsible for losing the parts of the earth. American presidents are exceedingly powerful, but I don't know that they have the power to lose a country. That's one way, several ways, actually. There's a question back here. Yes. Rick would like to ask, was McCarthy a hardcore alcoholic? Well, I don't know. If, I don't know if Joe McCarthy was a hardcore alcoholic. There have there have certainly been uh, evidence or reports that show he he did like to imbibe. That he was a, a heavy drinker. In fact, uh, I don't know the exact cause of death, but I think it was alcohol related. Yes. Why did Whitaker target Hiss to be his victim? Did they have a connection of some sort, or they had, they had been in the they had been friends, associates at one time, and they had been part. Of, I guess they had been part of the same Communist Party organization in the '30s. And the reason why I wanted to give you all that background on on, on Whitaker Chambers, which is so that you know he's a I mean, he clearly he's a smart guy, but he's got some character deficiencies that would have you know suggested to Alger, especially someone as smart as Alger Hiss, to find better better and newer friends. So. Uh, when, they, when the FBI started investigating Whitaker Chambers, his character profile says to me that he would have he would have done anything to point the finger at anyone else to take the life off of him. And and someone like him sees an opportunity to give some to bring some attention to himself. So he's a, a lower level of McCarthy, and he sees that this is his this is his moment. Think uh, remember the name Cato Kalin in the O.J. Simpson trial. Now that that guy like you, well, he's a what two three three bit player in that trial, but his moment came in that trial, and he's out there in Hollywood, and maybe I can get a movie deal out of this. He's one of those kind of individuals that'll take him out, take that situation, and exploit it. That's what Whitaker Chambers was doing, among other things. Yes. You may have covered this, but how did Whitaker Chambers achieve such credibility? Oh, oh. How did Whitaker Chambers achieve such credibility? On the, on the one hand, on the one hand, they didn't investigate him in thoroughly. Remember, even Joe McCarthy you know, said, I had these names, nobody ever asked him for the evidence. So in some cases, in some cases, Whitaker, Whitaker Chambers never was forced upon to provide the evidence of his charges. And don't forget that eventually, Alger Hiss confessed to perjury. So after that, they didn't really need Whitaker Chambers to provide his evidence. when. When Alger Hiss con confessed to the charge, they figured you confess to the charge, they have their man. So and then the whole thing with the pumpkin patch, right? <laughs> the microfilm, because you know, all spies had their microfilm in the pumpkin. Now, Richard Nixon did have did have evidence of, so he said of the of the of the spy craft, or rather of the evidence in that that pumpkin. And Richard Nixon made a great show of showing that he had, had the evidence. 
But there, there are so there are so many things in the holes of Whitaker Chambers' story. They really should have done done a deeper, better job of investigating him. And like I say, Audrey Hiss, who was a very respected diplomat and had a bright future in front of him, that whole thing just collapsed. I mean, he just crashed as a result of all that. Yes. Yes. Uh, where was, and you may be covering this in future, future sessions, but where was the FBI in all of this? I will be covering that. So we, we, know, we know from this session that the FBI was investigating Audrey Hiss and Whitaker Chambers, but that's a good question, both of you. It's a good question because at the time, the FBI was run by J. Edgar Hoover, who suspected everybody. Because J. Edgar Hoover knows where the bodies are buried and who owns the shovel. So they're definitely investigating this. J. Edgar Hoover is um, he's certainly anti-communist. He's certainly going to be using the FBI to not only, not only not only as an investigative arm, but also as a punitive arm of the government to nail people, to root people, to root out communists. And we should take that with a grain of salt because after all, he called Martin Luther King Jr. a communist as well. So it was a day and time when, again, just like in, in so, so many cases, that we've seen in our own time, to be accused is as good as to be found guilty. So if the FBI is deeply involved in all this, but I'll go over there and go in greater detail. Yes, ma'am. I just want to make a comment. Yes. If you are wise, a wise person, you like to find out about everything before you make a, a decision. But the hazard of that is if you read anything or question anything about these things, you might be declared in the cahoots with them. That's right. If you, if you, you mean if you push back on it, you charge? Well, yes. Yes. Look, you know what? I tell students all the time that listen, I don't I don't particularly care if you're, you know, you're, you're right, far right, left, far left. When you come into my classroom, I'm not trying to change your opinion, and my opinion is not in danger of being changed by yours. But the one thing, the, 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 one, the one common denominator the one through line in the class that I teach is the, you can think whatever you want, but the one thing you're not allowed to do is to not think critically. You must think critically. So have whatever opinion you want, but get through through critical thinking, argumentation, and supplying evidence. Because I gave the students a uh, uh, um, Deborah Lipstein, I think is her name. She was brought, she was sued by a British Holocaust denier and required to prove that he'd been lying. Now she had evidence that the Holocaust clearly existed and happened. So now she has to prove according to British law, she has to prove that the thing that this guy said didn't happen, didn't happen that he was lying about it. I don't even, I can't even wrap my mind around the legal implications of that, but she eventually did. And what eventually happened was that, what's so amazing about that is that you had all the evidence there and she simply did it by supplying the evidence and essentially destroying this guy. But she caused a flag for that in this country by disputing the fact that she was challenging a Holocaust denier. Because there are people in America who don't think that the Holocaust happened, which to me is just insane. But then again, I've been, I've been to Dachau. I smelled the gas still lingering in the wall. I've seen the gallows where the British nurses were hanged. All right? And plus, Dwight Eisenhower, when, he, when Dwight Eisenhower visited Ardra, the sub camp at Buchenwald, when he was there, Dwight Eisenhower wrote notes took pictures and went back to America and said, send journalists, photographers, congressmen, and senators, tell them to come as fast as they can. And he said in a note, because I fear one day, somebody might think that we said all this and made it up just as a means of propaganda. He wanted to get the record straight right then and there, thinking that at some point in the future, somebody would deny the Holocaust, as incredible as it seems. But you're right, in the current environment we have, when everybody's truth is the truth, well, yeah, you can be attacked for that. So I think that truth, of course, can be sometimes be a moving target, but facts are not. John Adams said that facts are stubborn things. And so there must be. So the facts of a charge, and then the truth that surrounds it. I'll tell you all something, I'll, I'll tell you straight up. Uh, a few months ago, I was asked to do a, a presentation about something. They said, well, they said, well, we want to advertise this. So what do you prefer pronouns? I said, what are you talking about? I don't understand what you mean. 
So, I mean, I get it now, but you know, I was still new to the conversation. I said, I'm not doing that. I said, my name is Fred Johnson. I'm a handsome male. <laughs> and if you, if you need more information than that, I can't help you. So, so I, I, in other words, I'm not going to allow myself to be co-opted into a cultural moment where people are doing it because you know this is what everybody else is doing. No, you're free to do that, but I'm not going to participate in that. And that's my truth. I'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.